Hello and welcome to chapter 8. In this chapter I'll feature some of my grandparents' friends who were judges, lawyers, and businessmen who came to visit them in Palm Springs in the mid-1930s. Doing the research for these chapters is a little like peeling the layers of an onion. Everyone is interconnected in this group of friends. In my research, I found that back in the 1920s and 1930s, people kept quiet about things. Some never kept any records. Are you familiar in any way that, uh, with uh, so-called organized crime, the Mafia, uh, La Cosa Nostra? Have you any knowledge at all of that? No, sir. None of, of None any of kind. Have you ever been associated in any way with any illegal activity? No, sir. Now, you're mentioning... Uh, Senator, could you re-ask that question? I don't think you understood it. Yes, sir. What, what, what were those uh, illegal activities? Huh? I gambled. Even Lou Wasserman, who ran MCA, Music Corporation of America, wrote notes on scrap paper, matchbooks, and napkins. His desk was clean. That's been the issue, tracking down these folks online. The information is so old it varies. One thing I noticed was that connected people tend to give the wrong names when being questioned by law enforcement or interviewed by the press. Like my step-grandfather, Al Epstein. I found on some old property deed that his name was Abraham L. Epstein. I thought it was Al, as in Alan. I honestly don't know which is correct, Al or Abe. I wonder what that generation would think of today with all the social media and smartphones. I can only guess. Let's get started with Abe Maravitz. Born Abraham Lincoln Maravitz in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, on August 10, 1905, to Joseph and Rachel Maravitz. His father was a tailor, and his mother ran a small candy store. They had five children. His mother was a very religious woman about her Jewish faith. Abe grew up in the Maxwell Street neighborhood of Chicago, which was home to tens of thousands of impoverished Jewish immigrants. As a teenager, Maravitz was a good boxer. Good enough, in fact, to earn some extra money by making the rounds at stag nights and men's smokers, then staples of neighborhood social life. Abe and his buddies would predetermine who would win the fights and agreeing that no one would get hurt. One of his fights had a referee who caught on to the scam and switched opponents. Maravitz was knocked down six times in the first round. During the day, he was an office boy for the established law firm Mayer, Meyer, Austrian, and Platt. Alfred Austrian, a partner of the firm, took an interest in Maravitz and paid for his tuition at the Kent College of Law in Chicago. Abe said, in those days, you didn't need a college degree to go to law school. That's how I wound up the only sitting federal judge who never went to college. Graduating at 19 in 1924, he had to wait two years to be eligible to take the bar exam. His boss and mentor, Austrian, pulled strings and got Abe a job as an assistant state's attorney in 1927. He worked in the prosecutor's office for five years when he met the love of his life, Mickey Curtin, a stenographer and bright, tough-minded Irish lass from Chicago's South Side. 
From that time, the two shared their lives together, but never married. In those days, you weren't supposed to date outside your faith. I tried going out with other girls, but found myself thinking only of her. A change in political administrations forced Maravitz out of the state's attorney's office, and he went into private practice with his two brothers, Harold and Sidney. Sidney's son is former state senator William Maravitz, who was married to Playboy Enterprise CEO Christy Hefner in 1995. They divorced in 2013. Some of their clients were gangsters who ran the city's nightclubs which was how Abe met his celebrity clients, like Joey Lewis, featured in Chapter 3 of this series. In the 1930s, Abe's talents came to the attention of the West Side 24th Ward boss, Colonel Jacob Arvey, who was looking for bright, young Jewish lawyers to move along politically. Arvey was another family friend, who's not in the films taken in 1936, but attended my grandmother's other brunches. This man is Sidney Korshak. He's not a celebrity, and he's not the head of a major studio. But in the movie industry, many people say Sidney Korshak is perhaps the most powerful figure in Hollywood, the man who makes a lot of things happen. Sidney was a protector and uh, highly feared in this town. He was becoming a kingmaker because of the enormous democratic pluralities he could turn out in the largely Jewish 24th Ward. In 1938, Harvey got Maravitz elected to the Illinois State Senate, just as he would help him win a state judge's seat in 1950. Abe was the first Jewish state senator in Illinois. In 1943, Abe enlisted in the Marine Corps, my alma mater. He was 38 years old. Because of his age, the Marine Corps assigned him to non-combat duties. His friend, Mike Fritzel, featured in Chapter 7 of this series, used to mail Abe packages with canned soup filled with scotch. Maravitz wanted to see combat, so he asked Adlai Stevenson, who was then a special assistant to the Secretary of the Navy, and who arranged for Abe and his CO, who also wanted to see combat, to get reassigned. His CO had resented Abe for using his big shot friends to help with this reassignment. That's why Abe asked to bring his CO along. Stevenson told Abe, your mother's never gonna forgive me for this. In those years, Mickey Kurt had become gravely ill. On July 16th, 1963, President John F. Kennedy nominated Maravitz to a seat on the United States District Court for the Northern District of Illinois, vacated by Judge Julius H. Minor. The United States Senate confirmed Maravitz on September 25, 1963, and he received commission on October 2, 1963. Judge Maravitz administered the mayoral oath to the late Richard J. Daley six times to Daly's son, Richard M. Daly, three times. Abe Maravitz died on March 17, 2001, of kidney failure at his home in Chicago's North Side. Uh, Abe Maravitz was a uh, protege of uh, Colonel Arvey in Chicago, who was a political power in Cook County and a very nice man. Abe Maravitz from Chicago kissing Lillian. He was an attorney and a state senator. Judge Joe Drucker. Not nearly as much about Joe Drucker as I could find about Abe Maravitz. On January 20th, 1955, Judge Drucker, 
a municipal court judge in Chicago, presided over the marriage of Ted Briskin, owner of the Revere Camera Company in Chicago, which, in 1950, was the country's second largest manufacturer of small movie cameras in the United States. The man in the gray shirt, Judge Joe Drucker, with a cigar in his left hand, and on his right, his bride, Joy, and they're on their honeymoon. On her right is Jack Pritzker of Chicago. Uh, this uh, breakfast ride was a very popular event in the desert in those days, maybe still. You'd ride out yourself or you'd go out in a tally hole. They all had fun doing this endless parade through the tally hole. This could have gone on for an hour, I guess. And it's all right if somebody doesn't bump their head. Then Joe Drucker is going to do a strip tease for us. I wonder if these were the cameras used to make these home movies. Briskin was the ex-husband of actress Betty Hutton and was getting married to actress Joan Dixon, who made 16 millimeter films from 1950 to 1958. They were at the office of his attorney and another family friend, Sidney Korshak. They separated after only being married for three weeks. Ted Briskin didn't believe in long marriages. In 1959, Judge Drucker presided over another wedding, this time at Sidney Korshak's apartment to the shoe magnate Harry Carl to Joan Perry Cohen, an actress and the widow of Columbia Pictures mogul Harry Cohen. That marriage lasted less than three months. Abe, or A.N. as he liked to be called, Pritzker, and his brother Jack, both were attorneys who worked at their father's firm, Pritzker & Pritzker. A.N. specialized in business law and Jack in real estate law. They left their father's firm in the 1930s to branch out on their own. Author Gus Russo writes in his book Supermob that Abe Pritzker's partner, Stanford Clinton represented Capone gang member Joe Fusco. As well as the mob-controlled Teamsters Pension Fund. Years later, when Fusco moved to Palm Springs, he had been hosting several mob bosses like Tony Arcado, Jake the Barber Factor, Jake Gusick, Frank Costello, as well as lawyers Abe Pritzker and Sidney Korshak. The mob employed many people in various professions in those days. You can see in this film footage, they all seem to be close friends. All these friends were connected in some fashion. This is Abe Pritzker, older brother of Jack, also known as A.N. Abe on the horse. He was the powerhouse of the family.
nice tight group. The following men were identified by my dad in his voiceover as attorneys. Eddie Cooper. From what I've been able to find, and there's very little information, I think Eddie Cooper was a labor lawyer in Chicago. Milton Smith, who was the uncle of composer Burton Lane. Nothing else I could find out about him either. The uh, tall man with Milton Smith is Skinny Perlman, who was married to uh, the daughter of Lou Rose of the Chicago Tribune, Lou's daughter Jean. Joe Schwartz, who is friend of John Jake the Barber Factor. That's about all I could find out about Joe Schwartz. We'll hear more about Jake Factor in Chapter 9. Maury Samuels represented the Chicago movie theater chain Balaban and Katz. And with the impaired arm, Maury Samuels, who represented the Balaban and Katz movie theater in Chicago. I couldn't find anything about him either. Balaban and Katz grew to own 125 movie theaters all over the Midwest, like Chicago's Uptown Theater seating 4,320 patrons. B&K had live entertainment in addition to showing movies. Of course, that live talent was represented by MCA, Music Corporation of America. Chicago friend, had a big printing business there, did a lot of City Hall printing. This is the man who had bagels delivered to Palm Springs every day by bus, and he would ride around on horseback, dropping off a bag with all of his friends and having a cup of coffee and visiting. Lastly, there was my step-grandfather, Al Epstein, also known as Epi. All I know about his professional career is what my dad told me. He was an entertainment attorney. His offices were down the hall from the Pritzker's offices. As I mentioned in earlier chapters of this web series, Epi was the only grandfather I ever knew. Linking all the facts, I came to the conclusion that Epi worked for MCA, Music Corporation of America. If I draw more conclusions, I come to the connection between all these people and the mob. In Chapter 9, I'm going to tell the story of the 1933 kidnappings. Charlie and Alice, we're up at Charlie and Alice's place. 
know they're going to be mad on the 11th. And Charlie's going to play the tune for you in a few minutes. Nice, nice tight, tight group. group.